Well, it sure looks to me like a soft landing. I mean, we got an absolutely, you know, incredible jobs report for November last week, uh, 3.7% unemployment, 199,000 jobs. We're creating jobs at a healthy pace. And more importantly, or as importantly, I guess I should say, inflation's come down. Welcome to Nix. Finding nuanced content on controversial topics is difficult, so we're building a technology platform to fix that. Stay tuned for new developments. In this debate, we have Robert Murphy and Dean Baker discussing their projections for the U.S. economy. You can find their bios and their relevant links in the show notes. Also remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter at the underscore Nix. We hope you enjoy the debate. Welcome back uh, to another Nix discussion. Uh, Today we have Dean Baker and Bob Murphy, uh, both are economists, and we're going to talk about whether we're headed for a hard or a soft landing and what we can expect in 2024. Uh, So the links to all of your guys' socials, etc., and your work will be in the uh, description of the video, Uh, so everyone should check that out if you're interested in learning more from them. Uh, So I think what we'll do, and... um, uh, Dean, maybe we'll start with you just because your last name starts with B and it's alphabetically in order. Um, let's just kick it off with, are we headed for a soft landing or not and why from your perspective? Okay, well, it sure looks to me like a soft landing. I mean, we got an absolutely you know, incredible jobs report for November last week, uh, 3.7% unemployment, 199,000 jobs. We're creating jobs at a healthy pace. And more importantly, or as importantly, I guess I should say, inflation's come down. So we're not yet at the Fed's 2% target, but we're getting very close and kind of, I shouldn't say wild card, what's baked in, we know that rents, which are a huge factor in the inflation rate, um, are coming down. And it's a little technical, but the rent index in both the consumption expenditure deflator and also the current price index, that's all rents in the economy. But what we have, both private indexes and the Bureau of Labor Statistics, has a rent of units that turn over, new tenant. And that always leads the other index. And that's showing much lower rental inflation. In fact, several of those are showing somewhat deflation. When you factor that in, we're on a path to 2% inflation. So when we ask, are we headed towards the soft landing? I'd say we have a soft landing. We're at moderate rates of inflation. It's coming down, not up. Unemployment's very low um, and doesn't show any evidence of rising. So kind of, you know, I think we've done it, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, And Bob, uh, maybe give us your perspective on the question. Feel free to address any points there or just give your general take. Well, sure thing. So first, I want to, again, thank uh, you for having this forum and for inviting us. I also want to mention I do respect, even though Dean and I, I think, are going to disagree pretty strongly on certain things in our policy recommendations if we get into those sorts of details. I do appreciate it. I have always found him to be a, a truth seeker. And like reading his writings of this, he admitted that he thought there was going to be higher unemployment at this point. And likewise, let me say I was wrong back when the rounds of QE happened. I thought we were going to see high CPI inflation like as of 2010. And that didn't happen. So, you know, so I, I just I appreciate that Dean is willing to say, yep, I didn't think we'd be here, but given that we are, you know, here's my take now. Uh, also, last disclaimer is I'm coming from the Austrian school, but what I'm going to be saying in this conversation, obviously, is just me. So if I'm wrong, it's it's me. <laughs> Don't blame my peers. Um, so having said all that, uh, I do think we're going to have a hard landing. And so there's and a few lines of evidence here. So one thing is um, the inverted yield curve. So I think a lot of your listeners are probably aren't familiar with that, but just in case they're not, the idea is that typically like maturities of U.S. treasuries, the, the longer the maturity, the higher the yield. But every once in a while, it so-called inverts, meaning like the, the yield on the three month is higher than on the 10 year, for example. That's a popular uh, spread to look at. And since World War II, uh, if you define it properly and you, you know, do the, the duration correctly in terms of like the monthly average and things like that, if there has been a sustained inversion of the 10 year, three month, there's almost no false negatives or positives. Again, there's a couple of borderline cases, but typically it's an extremely robust pattern that is an inverted yield curve signals, if you will, an impending recession. And the yield curve has been strongly, deeply inverted 
for a long time at this point. And so if you just kind of eyeball the chart, if there were a bad recession that began in 2024, it would be right on schedule, right? It's not that, you know, people would say after the fact, you know, years down the road, looking back, oh, wow, the yield curve was way early in its prediction, you know, right before the 2024, that, that, no, that things would be totally um, on pace uh, according to that particular metric. So the fact that we don't have a, and then going into my next point here, the last point I'll make on this opening remark is, is I, understand I understand that, that uh, the, unemployment the unemployment rate unemployment. now is, is low, but if you go back and look, for example, right going into the 2008 crisis, it's, it's eerily similar to what our situation is now, that the Fed had brought uh, rates down to 1%, uh, I think as of June 20, 2003, then they started hiking them up almost every meeting, back up to 5.25% in 2006, I believe. And then and unemployment was dropping still throughout that, you know, coming off of the dot-com crash. And it even after the Fed, you know, stopped hiking rates, unemployment still kept dribbling down for several months thereafter. And so it was similar to how we are now. And if you won't go back and look, people at the time and prominent officials too, like at various Federal Reserve branches and such, were calling it a soft landing. And yet clearly it wasn't as of, you know, going into 2007, the U.S. had achieved a soft landing and they got the inflation under control. No, it was setting us up for the worst crisis since the Great Depression. So uh, those are just some of my, my thoughts as to why I don't think right now that we, you know, that we're out of the danger zone. May have uh, dropped out from me, um, Dean. I'm not sure if you still are hearing uh, Bob, but I didn't hear Bob at the end, so I don't know if he's still going or not. He froze. Okay, um, Bob, can you hear us? I-, I can hear you guys. Yes. Okay, I think you just cut off uh, right towards the end of your summary of the of the of basically 2008, and you were kind of highlighting what people had said at the time. And I think we may have just missed your your closing remark there. Okay, so I'll just do like the last 15 seconds. Yeah, my point was that, yeah, the, the Fed had cut intra- – after the dot-com crash in the early 2000s, the Fed had cut rates down to 1%, held them there for a year, then started hiking again, I think, in 2004, basically every meeting, like 25 basis points typically. They raised them up to 5.25%, the you know, federal funds rate, and held it there. And the unemployment rate the whole time was going down, and it continued to drop for several months after they stopped hiking. And so I'm saying in that period, it's comparable to what we have right now. The unemployment rate, the absolute level was a bit higher than it is now, but it was low. And, and people at the time, and not just you know some guy on CNBC, but like Federal Reserve officials were saying, we, we achieved a soft landing. We, we did it. We, we got the inflation under control. Yeah, the housing's still kind of overpriced, but looks like smooth sailing. And so I'm saying that's just another example. Like a lot of the, the data people are using to say right now, we're through the worst of it was also true as of like early 2007. And clearly that was brewing was the worst crisis since the Great Depression at that point. Got it. Um, so Dean, I don't know if you want to maybe just kind of respond there. I can kind of let you guys ping pong on this point here. How do we how do we reconcile all the different data uh, given what Bob is saying? Yeah, no, Bob raises a lot of good issues. I also will return the compliments. I've read much of his stuff over the years. And I have to say, even though I'm probably 180 degrees at odds in most ways with the Austrian school, I often find them very interesting. And I learned a lot reading Hayek many, many years ago. Uh, So uh, I value the Austrian school, even though I often don't, or I would say generally probably don't agree with their conclusions on on policy in particular. Um, Let me just, uh, you know, again, a lot of topics there. I try to look at concrete issues in in the economy, and I understand the inverted yield curve, and Bob's right. That's usually a very, very good indicator. But I'm more interested in causality than correlation. So you go, okay, how how would we get the recession? And I'm very aware of the optimism in 205, 206, 207. Bob might remember I was out there yelling, housing bubble, housing bubble, housing bubble, and being laughed at. Um, You know, but it was it was clear to me that we were gonna have a very bad story. We were building a huge number of homes, uh, housing construction, residential construction peaked out at I think we're about 6.8% of GDP. The normal would be around three and a half to four. Um, and you know, I was saying, well, it's likely to go back there. And we had record vacancy rates, um, soaring house prices, record vacancy rates. I, I don't know, that didn't look right to me. 
Um, rents weren't rising anywhere close to, to, to house prices. Again, you don't expect it to be one to one. You expect it to be in the same general direction. Rents were rising just a hair more in the, the overall rate of inflation. So I was seeing the housing bubble and that was clear to me. The bubble was going to burst when that happened. Construction would plummet. Constru- uh, house prices were also driving consumption. You, you could see that. I mean, it wasn't a secret. You could see that the savings rate had gone to record low levels at that point. But on top of that, I mean, it wasn't. Greenspan was even writing about this, that people were cashing out money. They're refinancing. Uh, we had cash out refinancing. So someone would take advantage of the low rates. We had low mortgage rates. They take advantage of those and then they take out 20000 30000 and use it to uh, buy a car, take a vacation. Maybe they're paying for the kids' schools. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but you know, the point was it was spurring consumption. And this was all easy to see. So for me, when I was looking at the economy in those years, I'm going, this is going to crash and we're going to have a bad recession. So I, th- these were all things you could point to, You know, very, very identifiable. So I look at the economy today and I go, okay, what... What would give us this recession? What would give us the hard landing? So housing market, we saw already a fall off in starts. Could that fall further? Sure, but I don't know why it would. Um, anything, If anything, it looks like starts are bouncing back up. Um, they're not at real high levels, but um, they, they seem to be going up, not down. I don't see a story that would cause them to go lower. Um, consumption otherwise, well, if real wages are growing, why won't consumption keep growing? Um, that's kind of what we're seeing. Um, so consumption looks strong. Investment side, um, it's not as strong as we might like if we look at equipment investment. Um, structure investment is soaring. This is a direct result. You're welcome not to like them, but you know, the, I would say it's pretty clear the result of the Biden bills, the uh, Infrastructure Act, the uh, uh, Chips Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, they've structure investment is soaring. And again, would that turn around? Well, of course it can, but it's hard to see why it would and certainly any why it would anytime soon. Um, when we look at investment in electoral products, uh, we had the uh, Screen Actors Guild strike, which slowed you know a big chunk of it. People don't realize that's actually a big chunk of the economy, certainly in California. Um, that's over, so that's going to get up and running again. So you look at these things, they all look to be going in the right direction. Um, You know, with trade, the trade deficit's been going down. Partly that's because we're shifting back away from goods consumption that that we had in the pandemic. People weren't going out to eat and going to to plays and stuff, and now they are. So um, if we buy fewer goods, fewer imports, that's good for the, the trade deficit. So I just, you know, when you look concretely and you go, okay, what area of the economy are we going to see a big plunge in? I really can't see it. So that's why I'm pretty confident. It looks like we're on a very healthy growth path. We're seeing good job creation, good real wage growth, prices, uh, inflation falling in May, prices uh, actually falling, not just uh, disinflation, but in a lot of goods areas, we're seeing falling prices. All looks good to me. So I just don't see where we get, get the recession from in that story. Okay. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Bob. How? Where? That's kind of along one of the questions I sent you guys, which is, mm-hmm. where would we be seeing cracks start? So, do you have, do you have thoughts on where we might look? Okay. So, first, if I may, uh, let me just sort of give the the broad theoretical viewpoint of you know where I'm coming from, because because Dean is right. I also, it's not merely a, a correlation thing. Like, hey, I'm looking at these charts, and every time you know the birds fly over this piece of land there's a recession within eight months and so therefore that's not what i'm saying like the the inverted yield curve that actually dovetails quite nicely i've actually published co-authored a paper in an austrian journal on precisely this topic to say the standard theory of the business cycle that ludwig von mises and then hayek elaborated um, that that is consistent with the inverted yield curve pattern so really quickly in the austrian tradition the re- what happens with the boom bust cycle is the the banking system floods the market with um, credit that pushes down interest rates below the so called natural rate, and then entrepreneurs engage in longer processes because at the lower rates that a given project you know the, the present discounted value uh, seems higher um, at a lower interest rate discount rate, and so entrepreneurs collectively start a bunch of processes that don't that there's not enough genuine saving to get it across the finish line. And so that's called it. So it's an unsustainable boom and there's just not enough real resources that the the structure of production gets out of whack. That's the the basic Austrian story. Um, 
And so if you just think about it, like in terms of the three month and the 10 year, that would fit the pattern that when there's an inflationary boom, um, the short term rates over which the Fed has more control are going to get pushed real low because of higher inflation expectations, longer rates might go up. And so that's why you're going to see, you know, the normal quote upward sloping yield curve. And then when the banking system gets nervous because of high inflation or where they slam on the brakes and that makes short rates zoom up and then you get the inversion and then there's the recession. So it's not that the inversion, of course, causes the recession. It's the underlying real misalignment and investment in the structure of production in the Austrian story. But it does dovetail nicely with just that empirical pattern. So that in, in terms of things, that's what I have seen happen that look, going into the pandemic, for sure, the Fed had the loosest monetary policy you know, on record, brought interest rates way down again. Uh, M2 zoomed up. We saw rising CPI. The Fed slammed the brakes. M2 right now is coming down harder. Um, I believe I just saw a thing from uh, Steve Hankey uh, that the last time M2 dropped this rapidly was in the early 30s. And then you have to also go back um, to the, you know, the depression of the 1920, 2021 for a higher drop in M2. So again, there's lots of things as far as the specifics, like at the micro level, okay, but you know, you're given a big macro story, but specifically one thing I'll just mention is uh, with, with housing. I mean, if you look at the K Schiller price and like housing looks pretty expensive still right now. And I, this is purely anecdotal, but I, from talking with realtors and things, I think part of what may be happening is that, um, the reason price, you would think with the rise in mortgage rates that that should have had a bigger hit on home prices. But I think partly it's because it was so aggressive that right now people who normally would be selling because of a job or a divorce or whatever, they're saying, no, I don't want to lose this mortgage I have right now, this rate. And so they're, so it's like, ironically, because mortgage rates rose so fast, people are holding their supply off the market, which might be artificially propping up home price. Again, that, that last point, I'm not putting all my weight on that, but I'm just saying that's one example of, so yes, I think housing is overvalued right now, um, even though it, it hasn't been crashing like you might have supposed. Bob, I'd actually agree with you on that last point. I'm actually in a position to try to sell a home. <laughs> you know, I, I actually do think once uh, mortgage rates, and they have fallen a little bit because they peaked at over eight, and I think we're around seven. I have to check the rates today, but we're getting close to seven. Um, I, I do think when rates fall, we probably will see some drop in house prices. Um, but it's not going to be anything like what we saw in the housing crash. And it, it's kind of funny because people, you know, since I was one of the ones yelling about the housing bubble, people have always asked me, well, what about a bubble? Are we seeing a bubble? Are we seeing a bubble? And I, I answered no. I mean, I was following house prices. I know that they've risen um, and they're actually higher, um, even in real terms. I'd have to check the exact numbers today, but they were for a while higher in real terms than they were just before the crash. And I was looking and I was going, but it, it, this time it's not a bubble. It's being driven by the fundamentals of the market. What I mean by that is we had a decade. So we were building at the peak of the, the bubble in 2004 or 5. We were building over 2 million units a year. Um, if you go back to the 90s, 1, 3, 1, 4, something like that. Uh, so we were building a lot more homes for no obvious reason. The vacancy rate was rising. We were hitting record high vacancies. After the crash, construction plummeted. So if you look at 2008, 2009, we're way under a million units a year. It gradually inched up. So by, you know, the, just before the pandemic, we we're at 1.2, 1.3, which, you know, again, we could quibble what's the right number, what should it be. But when you have a decade where you're way below what, you know, to my view, would have been a sustainable level, you create a housing shortage, and that is what happened. And we did actually see the rises in rents. So it wasn't a case where we had house prices up here and rents down there. They, they were rising together. So that looked to me like a very fundamental story. Now, it did start to get a little bubbly, you know, and I, I was really I was really struck when the Fed raised rates, you know, just its first quarter point rate hike in March of 222. I mean, they had clear more were coming, but you know, the initial was quarter point. That's not a big deal immediately it turned around the market. So if you look at data from realtors, I think it's Redfin, they keep a record of how many offers you get on, on a house. And every every house, I'm exaggerating, it was getting you know multiple offers above listing, like immediately. And suddenly that stopped. It just totally changed the market. That's a bubble story. So basically what you had was a situation until they started raising rates, 
where you were seeing bubble-like activity, where people were buying, thinking, oh, no way I could lose, prices just keep going up. It's a bad story. I wish the Fed had raised rates sooner. I don't mean a lot sooner, but you know, had it done three months, four months sooner, I think that would have been a good thing. But the amount that you have for the market to fall, I think we're talking 5%, 10%. Um, obviously, no one's going to be happy to see their home price fall 5 or 10%. It won't have anything like the ramifications it did back in, in 07, 08, 09. So first off, people aren't leveraged the way they were, you know, back in, in 07. You, you don't have, you know, these mortgages, people buying zero down. People were buying even negative down. It was, uh, you know, I, this was, wasn't secret. I mean, people afterwards, like Greenspan, go, oh, well, we didn't know. I'm like, what's your job? How can you not know? I mean, it, it was, you know, it was all talked about in the business press. So it's not, it was not a secret. You're not seeing that today. You weren't seeing that in 2001, 221, 222 before rates started to go up. So you don't have the heavy leverage. People aren't borrowing against their homes the way they were. And we don't, we didn't have the construction boom. So, you know, again, I mentioned that starts had fallen from, we we're at about 1.8 million annual rate at the peak in March of uh, 222 when Green, when uh, Powell began to raise rates. Felt about 1.3, 1.4. Could that fall a little bit? It might. It wouldn't have a huge impact on the economy. I mean, it's not going to go to zero. So if it fell 100,000, I mean, that's some impact. Um, so I just, I, I think it is very likely as, as rates, and again, it is ironic, I agree with you, but I think logic's absolutely right. As rates fall, you'll see more homes come on the market, and we probably will see some easing of prices, but it's not, it's not going to have anything like the cataclysmic impact we had when the bubble burst 2007, 8, and 9. Okay, yeah, okay, just yeah, to just respond to a few respond points on that. Point so, that. So, again, again I am... I'm more confident in terms of like the, the macro indicators and the you know general uh, structural forces and in, in that position than we're getting into the weeds about specifically how would this manifest itself. So again, housing is one thing. I think also commercial real estate is still you know overvalued relative to the fundamentals, whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of horror stories again, anecdotal, but you know specific regional markets where the vacancy rates are absurd, and you know it's partly because of after you know, COVID, people are working from home and then, you know, they just decide, you know what, let me just stay back. You know, there's been a fundamental shift. And then again, with the rise in, in mortgage rates and such that it's, it's hard to, uh, to get some of these, these properties uh, with tenants in them. So I think there's, there's that element. So I think you're still probably, you know, the shoe still has to drop on the commercial side. Um, another issue too, and again, just to one possibility of things that, you know, earlier this year, you know, there were a string of bank failures and people, oh my gosh, like there's still hundreds of billions of unrealized losses on treasuries held by banks. And then we kind of just, you know, started talking about Israel. And, you know, th so I'm just saying there was like the news cycle moved, moved on, but I, I don't remember any resolution to that. So, um, you know, the, not that this matters in the grand scheme, but like the Federal Reserve itself has suffered a huge loss, in, you know, in, on paper in terms of the markdown, the asset value of its, of its assets. So again, Lots of particular things, but um, I, I guess I would I would come back to it and whether he does it in this round or, or later. I am curious if Dean, are you are you saying that? Yep, three years from now, looking back, people are going to say, "Wow, that was a huge inversion of the yield curve, and that was the biggest asterisk." You know, now going forward, when everyone brings that topic up to say, one would have thought that there was going to be a bad recession, and that was you know the one huge time since World War II that 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 indicator was totally off. Yeah, let me come to that in a second. I just want to deal because you did raise some very good points, but I'll come back to it. I'm not okay. dodging your macro question because it's, it's perfectly reasonable. Um, so on, on commercial real estate, I, I think that's definitely a troubled area. I mean, no two ways about it. Um, that's an area where I, I, I would love to see better policy that, you know, to my view, you really have to focus on converting a lot of this commercial to, to residential. And that is being done. It's not easy to do. I think people overstate the difficulties because I don't think that oftentimes people think about it clearly. So I've had arguments with people and they go, well, the new office buildings are really not designed. They go, okay, but we don't have to convert every office building. So some buildings, and I used to live in DC as there over a quarter century, there are a lot of apartment buildings that used to be office buildings. Um, what, what you need to do is get people out of the ones that are that, or I should say you should need to get people out of the ones that are easy to convert. So you want people to move their office to the ones that are hard to convert. I mean, that's a natural process, but you'd like to hasten the pace 
so that we can convert the ones that are easier to convert, you know, and, and this is being done to some extent. I, I forget where I saw the piece that might've been business week, but I won't guarantee it, but um, Cleveland, 13% of their vacant office space is being converted. I mean, that means you still have a lot to go, but the point is you have a very big foot in the door. Other cities, it's much, much less. Um, but you, you know, I think converting vacant office space is a big deal and that will be a problem for the economy. But just to be clear, commercial real estate is less than half the size of the residential market. So the potential downside there is much, much smaller. Um, Bob's point about the banks, that, that that is correct. You have a lot of banks that, uh, I mean, the Silicon Valley Bank, it just kind of mind boggling. What did they think they were doing? You know, so they're, they're buying long term assets they're buying bonds. And they're borrowing short term. And of course, the bonds lost a huge amount of value. You got a treasury bond at less than 2%. Some of the yields, four, five, I don't know at what point we were in March. But, you know, the, the value of that bond is a lot less. It's like 10 or 15, 20% less, depending exactly on its maturity. So they took a really big hit. And, you know, obviously they went under and Signature Bank. Uh, there are one or two other larger ones and insure a lot of small ones. That's a problem. Um, I don't see a general collapse. Um, the Fed acted aggressively um, and they, they bailed out those banks. I wasn't totally thrilled about that, but they weren't asking me. But in any case, um, I think that can be contained. And we have started to see longer term yields fall. So the 10 year Treasury is just a little over four now. Um, so the the extent to which that's caused these banks to face insolvency, it's much lower when you're looking at a four. 4% uh, 10 year treasury than a 5%. And, you know, my guess, maybe a little better than a guess, but not much better than a guess, that, that will continue to happen. So, so I think that is a cause for concern. I think we're most of the way out of the woods, but again, maybe the 10 year will go back up to five. I don't think it will, but if it did, you know, that stress will return. Now, the, the general point, you know, why is this sort of disinflation, th this period of an inverted yield different from others? We really had an extraordinary event. So, you know, we had this big argument uh, in the economics profession when we, we had, uh, you know, Biden's recovery package, which was very big, you know, probably too big. I mean, I, you know, probably been better if it was somewhat less, but in any case, it doesn't matter. It, it, it was what it was. We saw a big jump in inflation. Um, clearly, some of that was demand. I don't mean, think most of it was, but clearly some of it was. You know, if you hadn't had the package at all, yeah, there'd been less inflation. Um, so the question was, was this, a one-time story associated with supply chain disruptions that would be fixed when the supply chain was back in order, basically when we're through the pandemic. Um, or was this, you know, the story we had Larry Summers, you know, if you're here, he was very vocal. Larry's not shy. So, you know, worst, worst macro policy in 40 years, you know, we're going to have to have high unemployment, long period of time, inflation will come down very slowly. Doesn't look like Summers was right. Um, inflation came down quickly. So that's a story where I think, you know, what might ordinarily be true, a story we typically tell with an inverted yield curve giving you a recession. I, I think we had very unusual circumstances here. We had a once in a century pandemic created worldwide disruption supply chain. So it happened everywhere. And we got the supply chains pretty much back in order. I don't know if 100 percent, 95 percent, you know, mostly people can get what they need to get. It's not outrageously priced, not shortages. And that allowed for inflation to come down without a, a period of high unemployment. So I think it was a kind of one off. So I, I get it. I'm going against, you know, here we can look back however many times, you know, you know the number I don't, but the number of times we had inverted yield curves got a recession. I don't think that would apply here. Okay. okay yeah. Um, so, so thanks. And y yes, I agree that like the one thing that's making me somewhat you know, holding back a little bit with the con is to say that, yes, clearly the, the pandemic is a wild card, you know, with the, we said, you know, the just people wanting to stay inside on their own, but to the actual explicit government uh, lockdowns and such, clearly that caused all sorts of problems. Yes, supply bottlenecks, other things equal are going to cause a surge in consumer price inflation. And then you take those constraints away, you would expect it to come down just on its own, regardless of monetary policy. Having said all that, well, and also let me say, the one thing I'm extremely confident of is no matter what happens in 2024, the Keynesians and Austrians typically will just say, yeah, we were right. And any, <laughs> anything will say, well, there was a pandemic. You know, that's why, you know, the normal pattern, you know, so for sure that's going to happen. <laughs> that's a safe bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe the, it, this is a good time, Dean, for me to, because this is my take on the whole like teen transitory Larry Summers debate it seemed like both sides, um, again, painting with a broad brush, that the Larry Summers side was saying, 
you know, as of early, what, 2021, hey, guys, inflation is, is, is starting to creep up and it's going to get out of hand here. Um, we need to nip it in the bud. The Fed needs to hike rates and so on. And unfortunately, that's going to cause a big surge in unemployment. Sorry, but that's just the way it works. And then guys like Krugman were saying, no, this was all a transitory thing that the Fed should not raise rates. Inflation will come down on its own. And if it were to raise rates, that would cause an unnecessary recession. And so then the Fed did hike rates very aggressively and M2, you know, came crashing down too. It's not just the rate hike. It wasn't, they weren't just passively like, you know, they were slowing money growth, re reversing it and unemployment didn't go up. So it seems to me like in a sense, both sides were actually kind of wrong. <laughs> that, uh, you, if you get what I'm saying. So, um, yeah, yeah. The, so where we are right now is kind of weird. Like, I don't think either side actually predicted where we are right now, that the Fed would raise rates and unemployment would, would just be treading water. I, and uh, so it, let, let me stop. Is that, am I right in saying that, Dean? Oh, completely. You know, I, you know, I, and I think most of the people, Keynesians who are arguing against, you know, be clear, I, I, I thought the Fed should raise rates and, you know, as did, I think Krugman, I won't put words in his mouth, um, but not as drastically as they did. And my expectation was with the drastic rate heights they had, it would have a big impact on unemployment and it didn't. So, so in that sense, I was clearly wrong. You know, I thought there'd be a much bigger impact on unemployment. Um, on, on the flip side, though, we got what we wanted in terms of we got inflation down. So, so you know, the goal, I don't think it was anyone's goal to raise unemployment. The, the, the idea was, okay, that's how you get inflation down. I don't think, you know, I don't know that raising unemployment was an end in itself unless you're kind of a strange person. I, you know, I don't think you want higher unemployment. Um, so, so we got what we wanted. We got inflation down and we didn't get what we didn't want. We didn't get the high unemployment. Yeah. So just to put one more on that. So it was interesting. It, you may know this, Dean, but I like I, I, I read a lot of Krugman's work and, and such. Um, and it seemed like his he was trying to thread a needle. It was interesting that as of uh, what September of this year, his position. And, and again, you know, you, you don't need to take my word for it. But I believe what he was arguing was, see, team transitory. You know, we were off a little bit in the timing and some of the man, but we were basically right. We brought inflation down without the need for a recession, you know, unemployment's still fine. So clearly that inflation was due to the supply bottlenecks and whatever. It wasn't that air demand was overheating and such, but we still, you know, if the, the Fed with this tight monetary policy, which again is totally unnecessary, we still might have a recession. And if we do, it's not because it was needed. It's just completely unnecessary. And so it seemed like he was trying to have his cake and eat it too, where the, you know, the inflation coming down had nothing to do with the rate hikes, but if there is a recession, that's because of the rate hikes. And so, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not going to try and speak for Krugman. Obviously, he's someone's <laughs> very capable of keeping for him, speaking for himself. But I'll just put my own gloss on this that, you know, the the joke was, well, transitory is taking a long time. Um, right. And it did, you know, so so the high on high inflation uh, lasted certainly longer than I expected. And I think Krugman's pretty much said longer than he expected. Part of that story was, you know, keep in mind where we were in, in March uh, of 221 or February, I guess I forget when it was passed, February, March of 221, the start of the Biden administration. Um, the expectation was, you know, we had the, the COVID vaccine, it was rolling out, that we were getting COVID under control and we things would start to get back to normal. Now, what actually happened was we had the Delta wave you know, which uh, hit pretty hard, you know, in the summer that we, in fact, and I think if you look at mortality rates, I think they were actually higher in the summer. So even though we were getting people vaccinated, one, we didn't get everyone vaccinated, two, it wasn't 100% protection. So, so the economy got another big hit with the, from COVID with, in, in the summer. And then we got the Omicron wave that hit in December and January. Now, I don't think, I certainly didn't anticipate that. I don't, you know, I'm sure there were some epidemiologists that were warning, warning about subsequent waves, but, you know, I'm not up on the literature. So I didn't anticipate that. I think most of us didn't anticipate that. And then, of course, in uh, February of 222, we got the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which, you know, sent oil prices and a number of other commodity prices through the roof. So, you know, okay, I didn't anticipate that. That definitely had an impact on the economy. Does that fully explain the longer inflation? I think it goes a long way. I'll just put it that way. Does it fully do it? We could argue over that. But, you know, again, we did ultimately get, you know, the you know pandemic under control. It's still there, but it's not hugely disrupting our lives. Um, we've recovered from the economic impact of the Russian invasion. Uh, you know, so oil prices are 
I think they're actually below. I have to double check. I think they're below where they were when they when they had the invasion. Um, and I certainly know that's true. I follow you know the other commodity prices, wheat prices, corn prices. They're all pretty much back again on them day to day, but they're pretty much back to where they were pre-invasion. Um, so so we got the supply side fix. Took much longer because you know I would say unanticipated events. I don't you know I'm not particularly trying to make an excuse here. I didn't anticipate them, and they definitely had an impact. Now going forward, if we get a recession. Um, I think the Fed hiked rates more than it had to. It did. It, it rate hikes slowed demand in the economy, and I think did slow inflation. I've argued with people, you know, some of my Keynesian buddies. They're saying, "Well, it had no impact." Well, no, you, you definitely saw a fall in housing starts. If we still had housing starts at one point eight million rather than one point three, that would be more demand. I think we'd have more bottlenecks in in the construction sector. Um, you know, and there were other things I'm sure it had an impact on. People buy fewer cars when. They have to pay, you know, 6% interest or whatever would be on a car loan today as opposed to 2%. Um, so I think it definitely had an impact. Um, so, you know, again, I don't quarrel at all. I think uh, Powell was right to raise rates. Did he have to raise them as much as he did? I would say no. Um, but I think he did. He was right to raise rates. And I think it had an impact. I, I hope they start moving to lower them. It looks like they're going, you know, he, they just had a meeting today, of course. And um, I didn't hear his full press conference, but I think he made it clear that, their expectation is the next moves downward. I, I hope it's sooner rather than later. But, um, but yeah, you know, they're, they're definitely at risk having uh, rates as high as they are today. And, you know, I hope they start to move downward. But again, I'm not going to say that it wasn't right to raise rates. It was. I just don't think they had to raise them as high as they did. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I should probably at this point just clarify. Um, and I'm, I'm curious too, Dean, what your take is on this. That when I say talk about the Fed, like cutting rates or raising rates, that's shorthand, I mean, yes, that's the official policy tool they're using. But in my framework, the, the reason that really has an impact on, you know, the direction of investment and the structure of production and so forth is because it's affecting the, the, the rate of, of money growth. growth yeah. And so, yeah. um, so, so specifically here, like when I say the Fed tightened, I mean, again, you could like debate from uh, like mid 2022, the, the monetary base has been trending down. Like I say, M2 is down, I think like four and a half percent, something like that, which again is the biggest drop. So normally for listeners who don't know, like M2 kind of typically just grows and it's just the rate of growth is higher or lower. But here to actually have come down four and a half percent, something like that, that hasn't happened since the early 30s. Uh, and that was not a particularly good time for the economy then. So, so that's what I mean when I say the Fed hiking rates. That you know, that that's really what I mean. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'm just curious. Are you is that too, Dean, where you're coming from, or do you actually think it's more like the level of the interest rate that's the relevant issue? I do think it's the level of interest rates. Um, you know, I, I, I'm of course familiar with you know the the monetary arguments. I don't follow them closely in part because I just don't think they ma- they matter that much apart from their impact on interest rates. So okay. you know, so insofar as you know, the tightening of the money supply is leading to a jump in rates that matters. But, you know, but it, but it's not it's not an isolation, in other words. And obviously they do. They obviously interact. But I'm saying, you know, if we had a big movement one way or the other in money supply that for whatever reason isn't having an impact on interest rates. That wouldn't concern me. OK, um, I guess one other, sort of a, a bone to, to your perspective, Dean, that I I was curious to see, because it seems like part of what's going on here is. The, like the reason people who are, especially those who had been on team transitory now are just feeling, okay, yeah, we were off on some other ticket, but basically we were right, is that unemployment, in that framework, unemployment should not have come down, or sorry, uh, CPI inflation <laughs> should not have come down this rapidly without there being a concurrent jump in unemployment. So even if, you know, like if I'm right and four months from now, there's a bad recession that kicks in, somebody like Krugman could plausibly say, Okay, but clearly that wasn't the drop in inflation that caused that because, you know, the the timing mismatch. So I went back and looked. And yes, that is typically true that uh, historically in the U.S. at least is what I was looking at. If there is a sharp drop in the rate of CPI inflation, then unemployment tends to go up. You know, it's kind of like a Phillips curve thing. However, the the one one counter example I did find was in the early 50s. So I'm just looking at the chart here Um, as of like early 51 year over year increase in the CPI was above 9%. And then it came down within over the next 24 months to, it looks like under 1%. So again, yeah. inflation going from like nine down to one and the unemployment rate was at three 
the whole time. So presumably they had something to do with the Korean War, like the expenditures and then coming down. But I'm just saying that is a particular example for people who are, you know, just want to look at that. I don't have any more to say on that particular thing, but that is an example where we did see something similar to, to what just happened. Yeah, and then, you know, there was a recession that began, it looks like in mid 53, you know, whether you want to say that that did, had nothing to do with it, you know, I don't, I don't know. But anyway, I'm just saying yeah. I do see from your perspective wh why people could be thinking the, combating inflation, we, we managed to have a soft landing. And if there is a recession that starts in 2024, that's because of an unforced error. I get that perspective, and I'm just pointing this this episode in the '50s as a as a counterexample to say this sort of thing did happen back then too. Yeah, so for you know, I think I'm pretty sure Krugman wrote about this explicitly, but I think for those of us team transitory, we're looking to that experience, saying, okay, so here you have like this extraordinary event, huge war spending, and it did cause inflation, and then we stopped it. You know, stop the war. The war was over. You know, they had the uh, armistice or truce, but whatever we called it at that point. Um, and the inflation came down, and we didn't have a recession. So, you know, I think our hope was always that that would be sort of the story we see now. And you know, if we get a recession, you know, I'm not, I'm not so worried. I'm going to maintain my reputation in the economics profession. But I do want to try and be able to explain it. So if we do get a recession going forward, um, you know, first I would just look to, you know, what's the Fed? Is is the Fed lowering rates? Is it keeping? Because, again, I think at this point there's no reason for the federal funds rate to be as high as it is. So I would love to see the Fed, you know, start to make some moves towards lowering. I don't mean, you know, lower to a point or two points. You know, quarter point moves would be fine, you know, just, just to start moving. Because I think we do have, you know, if you just look at, uh, the the federal funds rate relative to the inflation rate it's 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 extraordinarily high if we you know say we have an inflation rate somewhere two and a half percent I mean we could argue where we are exactly a day but somewhere around there and we have a federal funds rate of five two five um, that's you know a bit a hair less than three typically the real rate uh, you know prior to the pandemic was a half one percentage point so that's a pretty high real rate so I would hope they would start lowering rates and. You know, I that that's where I would look to. I'd say it's an unforced error. If they lower rates and we still have a recession, okay, well then I, I I'm gonna have to look for another explanation for it. Right. Okay. Uh, it, maybe it's appropriate right now for me to to state the the standard Austrian view on this stuff because people might be misinterpreting me. So you know, again, we, in the Austrian view, it's the the boom period that's the problem when when rates are artificially low that causes what, what they call male investments. It's unsustainable. That sets us up for an inevitable crash. And so then when the, the banking system, you know, guided by the central bank and, and that kind of a framework, when they stop pumping in so much new money, then, you know, rates rise and then there's a crash. So the issue in that framework, it's not that, oh, gee, if the Fed had just kept rates low, we would have had good times forever. It's that, no, just those male investments keep piling up. They should have not had the, you know, the easy money policy in the first place. And so that, yeah, after you get through a crash, resist the temptation to just, you know, slash rates down to really rock bottom levels to try to jumpstart the economy, you know, let, you know, the male investments get cleansed out, keep rates at a more appropriate level, and then you'll have more sustainable long run growth. So, so that's kind of the, the framework in case I just want people to be misunderstanding. Uh, a slight di digression, but I, I don't know if you saw it. This is probably about 10 years old now, maybe a little longer. Someone did this little video of Keynes versus uh, Hayek, how we've been oh, yeah. fighting for 100 <laughs> years. I thought, I thought that did a good job of capturing the essence of it. Basically, Keynes was a party guy. He's, you know, drinking all the time right. and going out with women, whereas uh, Hayek's very stern and like, no, you shouldn't yeah. be drinking. <laughs> so yeah. uh, they, they kind of captured it, but yeah. Yeah, isn't there like a um, epic rap battles of history I don't know if you guys remember that YouTube channel. They used to make fun of kind of historical figures and have them rap battle against each other. I think there's one between the two of them. Okay, yes. I only saw that one. I yeah, probably one, should go yeah. look into the channel and see the other. Yeah, others. what <laughs> Dean's talking about is it, John Popola is the guy, the master. Oh, okay. And they, there's actually a sequel. So, yeah, there's the original Hyatt Kane's rap video, and then there's a follow-up, and I forget. How, so, yes, that, that's class. But also, I know what you're talking about, that there's a separate YouTube channel that, you know, has whatever, you know, Herodotus yes. versus so-and-so or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so I think, you know, kind of thus far, we've really diagnosed the past. We are kind of getting a little bit in the future. I, I almost want to shift the conversation, kind of focusing on that a little bit, just because I think people are curious, <clears throat> myself being one. But uh, the Fed has signaled that it is, at least the next move is going to be lower. 
Um, so that's one thing to pay attention to. Another thing that I think is on a lot of people's minds is the uh, the federal deficits and just the amount of debt and then how much the borrowing costs are uh, raised now for that relative to times past. So I maybe you guys can kind of dissect all of that. What does all of that mean going forward for us? What can we kind of expect uh, over the next year, maybe two, given all of this that we know now? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick here. Um, you know, I do think the Fed will be lowering, um, you know, and that, that helps a lot of things. You know, the pressures that Bob and I were talking about in the banking system will help that. It, it should help to unlock the the housing market. I think I had said this before, maybe both of us said it, that the, uh, if you look at sales of existing homes, they're down by a third from where they were in 221, which is a lot. I mean, it's a lot of people would like to move and they're not, uh, they don't feel they're able to, the rates are too high, whatever. So I think they will lower rates and that will be very good for the economy. Um, I, I have to say, I'm not terribly worried about the debt deficit, um, interest rate. You know, I mean, I'd rather not pay out that much money in interest because it does, it is a drag on you know, other spending, you know, because at the end of the day, yeah, there's a limit to how much we can spend. And if we're paying out another 1% GDP in interest costs, that's that's a problem. It's not a disaster. I mean, we have paid out more in interest costs than the 90s. Um, so it's not a disaster. Um, one thing I'll say is very promising. It's gotten some attention, but I don't think anywhere near as much as it deserved. We saw the incredible productivity growth, the, the, the second and third quarters. The third quarter they just revised was 5.2%. No, no, quarterly productivity is hugely erratic. And, you know, I wouldn't put a lot of stock in any one month or even two months number. I think it was 3.5 in the, the second quarter. But that, that is striking. And there is a story we could tell where we are going to be seeing much better productivity growth, basically AI and other technological innovations, they seem to be having a real impact. I played around a little bit with AI. I don't know if Bob has it all. It's, I had to do a reference section for me. It was very nice. You know, it didn't, you know, it'd take me a couple hours or something. And I just said, give me, you know, I told what references I wanted, pulled them out, did a little editing, had in 10 minutes, you know. Um, yeah, that's a trivial one. But, you know, the point is it, it could do a lot of stuff that would take a lot of people's time. And I think it has incredible potential. So, I think that's, you know, really a, a striking story that's going to allow for a lot of uh, sort of good economic gains, uh, you know, improvements in living standards over the next, I don't know, three, five years, maybe longer. But it, it's it's a really big, to my view, really big part of the picture in terms of what we're going to be looking at going forward. Okay, yeah, uh, I think I agree with a lot of um, what Dean said there in terms of the positive predictions. Uh, so yeah, I'm just pull up again, looking at the, the yield, the, the, specifically the 10 year minus the three month. And right now we're still, uh, even though it, like it, it, it troughed and then it started to come up and it bounced back a little bit, but it's still right now, the level of that is far lower than it, the lowest it got, um, in the previous, uh, three, I'm not counting the, well, that one too, the previous four recessions. Okay. So in order, you know, so typically the patterns, the yield curve deeply inverts, and then it bounces back and becomes upward sloping. And then soon thereafter, the official recession starts, according to NBER. So I'm saying technically, th th that's what I meant earlier when I was saying if a, re if a bad recession started, you know, in the second quarter of 2024, it's that would be right on schedule using this one particular metric. It's not that that the yield curve is still inverted right now. So typically it uninverts and then the recession, you know, eventually kicks in not th that long thereafter. So for that to happen, the Fed would need to start cutting short-term rates in order to make that just happen for that standard pattern. And presumably, you know, the underlying mechanism, like, again, it's not just the chart is somehow causing a recession. What's going on, presumably, is that the Fed, you know, hikes rates, tightens, that sets in force or sets in motion forces that, you know, make the economy start to turn. And then the Fed policymakers see that they realize, uh-oh, things are softening. Let's loosen up a bit rates come down short rates in particular and then that's why the curve uninverts and then you know it's still though too little too late they can't stop the actual you know recession from happening so i think that's explains the typical pattern so yes for that to be true the fed would need to start cutting rates i mean just even simplistically if i think there's going to be a hard landing in 2024 surely three months before it officially starts there's going to be a lot of signs that it's coming and the fed's clearly going to be cutting rates to try to, you know, cushion the blow. So there's that. The other main thing that Dean said with AI, yes, I've been playing with chat GPT, in particular with GPT-4. Um, I've even like written some blog posts and done a podcast 
uh, series on this, Dean, just telling like businesses to say, hey, if you haven't looked in this, particularly if you have a lot of telecommuting workers, there's a sense in which you've got a pretty capable worker here that, you know, is like 40 cents an hour. And, you know, depend- their skill set's limited. Like they can't do things like like those logic puzzles of my son and I were playing with it. Like you have a fox and two chickens and you're trying to get them across the river and the fox and the chicken can't be in the book. It was hilariously bad on it, like violating the rules. And I kept saying, yep, we did it. And I was like, no, you violated the rule of fox and the chicken. And it said, oh, yes, my apologies. Let me revise. And it did the same thing, you know. So, but yet I was asking about like girdles and completeness theorems and it was telling me very accurate. So it has certain strengths and weaknesses. Like you could say it lacks common sense, I suppose. But yeah, I think as more and more businesses, like, you know, especially if they get consultants who can come in and kind of say, well, this aspect of your business, you could break that down and outsource this to, you know, a chat GPT module and blah, blah, blah. I think there's going to be huge gains. So it's a competing thing. And I'm, I'm trying not to have it both ways that no matter what happens, I'm going to say, oh, see, I told you <laughs> is that I, so I do think, yes, the, the, the boost to productivity from AI is not going to offset you know, these other scary things I'm warning about. So I do think, yes, there's going to be a bad recession in 2024, but more medium term, I think things are going to be good. That productivity is going to be a heck of a lot higher because people are going to be amazed at at all the stuff this AI is doing. Yeah. At the risk of carrying on with the digression, uh, I've just been very struck. I think it is underappreciated some of the things with AI. So for example, Waymo has been running taxis, uh, self-driving taxis in uh, San Francisco now for uh, several months. I don't know when they first started, I think uh, back in the summer, maybe longer. And now this is their self-reporting, so obviously people have to be skeptical. But they claim that their accident rate is a quarter of that of ordinary drivers, which, you know, you could reduce accidents by three quarters and have a, you know, a self-driving car. That's pretty good. Now, again, maybe it's half, you know, again, maybe they're lying totally. I don't think so. But, you know, that that's 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 a very impressive story. I presume that's going to spread. Um, the other thing, you know, again, the uses of AI, um, it, it, it can, uh, again, a couple of years ago, I saw a study where they had programmed a, a system to uh, diagnose patients. They would give them, uh, you know, the symptoms, you know, the test, you know, readings and this and that. And based against doctors, you know, they had expert doctors in the fields and they, they, they said the AI was better 70% of the time than your kind of random doctor who you got out there to try and diagnose someone. So again, you know, everything should be taken with a grain of salt, but the idea that you know, you could, you know, instead of seeing your doctor, you could see a, you know, someone, you know, presumably you want a medical professional. You don't want someone who's just, you know, off the street, but you no know, medical professional, physician's assistant, uh, you know, nurse practitioner, whatever, plug in, you know, here's your blood, your, you know, your blood pressure, whatever. And they can give you a diagnosis that will be better than what you have gotten having spent time with the doctor. That, that That's a pretty impressive story. Yeah. If I could just on that point again, just to, I think a lot of times people, and you understand why, like they, you know, you know, humanity, we have this, you know, the essential spark and, you know, these machines won't replace this kind of thing. And there's a lot of these things people will like search for, oh, the reason that the AI is not up to like the best human. And and that's the thing is the issue is not, you know, like if they have like eventually AI is doing brain surgery, it's not that does it need to be better than the best brain surgeon who's a human on planet earth? But no, if it's like 70th percentile and it doesn't need to sleep, it's never going to come in drunk. It's never going to, you know, just do, you know what I mean? So like, that's like, and then also too, if it does do something stupid, like, you know, it just, because the way they train these things, apparently they're already doing this where they have like videos recording the best brain surgeons in the world, like just getting thousands of hours of training data to then be able, you know, to, to make these systems happen. But then, you know, once it's up and right, if they do do something horrendous or like the self-driving cars, if there's some freak set of circumstances that most human drivers would have known, oh, in that case, you go up on the grass, you don't hit the lady in the stroller, but the AI makes the wrong decision. Okay, that happens. They reprogram it. And then, boom, the whole fleet now going forward doesn't make that mistake again. Whereas it's not like humans, like once there's a drunk driving accident, humans say, whoa, let's no no humans ever going to drink and drive again. That doesn't happen. So even though these things might be clumsy and stupid in the beginning, I think, you know, they're just going to improve very rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Well, we agree. AI is a good story. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah. That's something to look forward to. Um, okay. Well maybe kind of one of my last uh, questions 
uh, to put forth to you guys. Um, I listened to uh, probably nine podcasts of investors um, and, you know, kind of get a general idea of what they think. They, they happen to be somewhat pessimistic, but one of the things they brought up was that they felt like the Fed it, has lost some degree of credibility. Um, and so I was wondering to what degree you guys agree with that. And, you know, if that, well, is that true? Um, how much of a problem is that? And how do they regain it if you think it is true? Um, but they were basically expressing that the bond, given, I got to try and remember the best way to explain how they were highlighting it. But I guess in a nutshell, they just feel like the Fed has lost some degree of credibility over the last, whatever, couple of years. And so now, you know, what do they do with that going forward? Well, I, I, I think there was a real concern on Powell's part that he had, you know, in waiting so long to raise rates. And his response to that was to jack up rates through the roof. So, you know, he kept rates at zero. And again, you know, a little bit, this is 2020 hindsight, but I, you know, I was making a big point of jumping out there yelling back in, you know, December 21, time to start raising rates. But, you know, if someone asked me and someone probably did, I would have said, yeah, I probably could start raising rates, you know, you know, so I think he definitely could have done it sooner. But I think he was very worried that he was behind the curve, uh, and, you know, which I think was right. He is, was behind the curve. And then he responded with this very aggressive set of rate hikes. So I think he's, he perceived the risk of losing credibility. But having done that, you know, again, whether the Fed rate hikes were the main factor of lowering inflation or simply the curing of supply chain, certainly in, in this sense, it's beside the point. Inflation did come down. So the Fed's ostensible test of credibility here, you know, at least my understanding is that they, they're committed to 2% inflation and they acted aggressively and, you know, we're not quite at 2%, but we're pretty damn close. So, you know, I, I think they've done, you know, what was necessary and then some to bring back, you know, to, to maintain their credibility. So I, you know, again, I can't speak for every investor. I know, uh, obviously, all all of them have different views. I don't doubt most of them are probably more hawkish than I am. But you know, if the measure of credibility is, are you focused on getting two percent inflation? I, you know, I, I think the answer to that has to be yes. Okay, so f- finally, we're going to get some genuine clash here on this discussion. <laughs> um, and I'm tr- I'm trying to answer your question more like from the like uh, the average you know person in the bond market. Or so because I. The people I hang out with, you know, I'm a fan of Ron Paul, you know, and the Fed, you know, that sort of thing. So, you know, that's that's my perspective. I don't like the central bank as an institution so clearly, but that's not what your question was. You weren't asking me, do I think the Fed should should stick around? You're asking about the credibility. So I think, um, yeah, like, for example, after the 2008 crisis and all the rounds of QE occurred and guys like me were warning, hey, this is very inflationary. This is going to hurt the dollar. What are they doing? And then it, we look like chicken littles for a period there. Okay. And then, you know, and so guys like Bernanke, you know, seems like he, he was saying, no, no, it's fine. If, if inflation kicks up, you know, we'll turn it off like that. And, but notice what was interesting is he had to go on 60 minutes. And that was fairly new at the time that you know, monetary policy was boring before the 2008 crisis. People didn't care about it. It just seemed like a thing happened. Whereas, you know, with QE and guys like Glenn Beck were doing his show and showing the monetary base on a chart. And he was in a forklift. So I think it really got like right wingers up in arms and hot and bothered about monetary policy such that, you know, the Federal Reserve chairman had to go on national TV to calm everyone down. So I think, you know, there, there's that element. So here, yeah, if 2024 comes and goes and unemployment, you know, doesn't break four and a half percenters, I think people, the Fed will have regained a lot of its credibility. But if there's a bad crash, then I think think a lot of people will be cynical and say, well, yeah, what do you guys think was going to happen? You open up the monetary spigots during COVID, CPI went up higher than all you experts kept telling us, and then you were behind the curve, and then you slammed the brakes and you crashed the economy. Like, you know, you, what the heck are you guys doing? And like little things too, last point I'll make is, it, it did seem like the Fed's been sort of playing loosey-goosey. Like they, they announced, oh, we're going to have average inflation targeting. And then I, it seems like they kind of just moved away from that. So it, it seems like they were doing a few tricks in terms of managing expectations, you know, whether that's Powell's fault or just more generally institutional, you know, I, I can't say, but I, I do think there's a growing number of people that believe that they are kind of just getting painted into a corner. 
And, and then to, to harken back to something you said earlier about the, I, I didn't address, I forgot to, I'm unlike Dean, I am worried about like the long-term debt implications of the U.S. government. Um, just one quick, when I was younger in the eighties, getting politically active, Social Security, like the entitlement crisis was always this thing that was like 20 years in the future. We better get our act together. And we are now in what back then they were calling a crisis where, you know, the, the incoming receipts from you know worker paychecks is not enough to cover the outgoing payments and they're whittling down the so-called trust fund. So anyway, I'm just saying there's lots of things like that where things that people were worrying about, like budget hawks, fiscal hawks were worried about 20 years ago. We are now... In, in that. And, you know, so I, I think that that is problematic. Got it. Well, um, any sort of last remarks or last words? I think we've, we've covered quite a bit. Um, I think it's very uh, good discussion. Very helpful to have both of your viewpoints coming from at it from different angles. Uh, but yeah, I was just going to give you, if there's any last words, I'll let you have, have those. Yeah, well, I guess I'm the big optimist here. I will just say, you know, getting to the Fed, because I've had plenty of issues with the Fed too. But, you know, one of the things, because you're absolutely right to note the change. If you go back to the 90s, Greenspan, you know, there was a joke, Greenspan speak, that it was opaque. I remember his wife, Andrea Mitchell, made a joke that uh, he had to ask her three times, would, would she marry him before she understood what he was saying? <laughs> you know, and, and anyhow, the, 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 there is a deeper point there, though, that they were, they de- were deliberately opaque, whereas, you know, the subsequent uh, chairs, you know, starting with Bernanke and then Yellen and Paul, have tried to be transparent. You can like or dislike what they end up doing, but they have tried to be, you know, more transparent on what, they, what they're trying to do, what their thinking is. And I think that's a good thing, but you know, there definitely is a change there. And anyhow, so I'll just let throw that in. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess my final remarks too are, uh, you know, with this stuff, again, you, you hope that you're wrong when, it, when it's, you have a pessimistic view. So yeah, on paper, what the fed has done and with in my framework is setting us up for a big crash. If it doesn't happen, you know, what would I say? I guess I would look and see, geez, did the improvements from AI really cushion the blow or was it, that yeah, just the pandemic was such a weird one-off thing that the normal framework doesn't apply there. I mean, I guess you know that's the, what you'd have to do to go see to reevaluate. You know what? Why would, would they get wrong? But again, uh, just big picture yield curve standard metrics are the conference board's leading in, uh, economic indicators. Even the components that aren't directly a, you know a derivative of the inverted yield curve, because some of it is. Again, a lot of those were are flashing. So with a lot of it, it's it's conventional metrics are saying, geez, there, we actually should have been in a recession already. I wonder why we're not. And so if that stuff does hit, you know, in mid 2024, I think a lot of people are just going to say, okay, yeah, that, that's what we thought. And why, why were we so optimistic? How, how did we think we were going to escape this? Uh, awesome. Well, um, thank you again to both of you. I really appreciate you guys uh, taking an hour out of your day to come talk about this. I think uh, quite a few people will be interested in getting your perspectives. And I also appreciate uh, how constructive you guys were with each other. Um, you don't always get that from people with different viewpoints today. Uh, so I'm very appreciative. I think other people will be as well. I'm going to call all sorts of names as soon as we're off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You guys can go back to Twitter now and start um, yeah. you know, freaking out. Um, well, well, joking aside, I can't control my followers, Dean, just so you know. So <laughs> It's okay. I, I won't want to be responsible. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, take care, you guys. Uh, it was great right, to meet you. And listen thanks, to you. Bob. Good talking to you. Okay. Again. Thanks, guys. Take care. We hope you enjoyed this next debate. For more, you can like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter at the underscore Nix. We'll see you next time.